Good morning. The lifelong learning space uh, for professionals continuing on uh, to upskill is now $350 billion. It's growing at 10 to 15 percent a year. A substantial portion of that is in the States. Um, and, the, and the question that I, I want to sort of uh, uh, lead with and, and, and think about uh, is why are universities not in that space? So, uh, to some degree, whoops, um, to some degree, it's obvious that they should be, right? The, the, they have the content, they have the expertise, they have global brands, they have huge communities, um, but they're not there. And what they did, in fact, with the current players, uh, Coursera and edX, uh, is, is kind of sell their birthright. They said, look, um, we'll give you our brands, we'll give you our content, and in exchange, we can get some inexpensive leads for our degree programs. Um, and I think, I think that was a mistake, uh, and I think we can fix it. So that dichotomy of universities stay in the degrees and, and we can give away this other stuff really came out of a, of a disagreement. Um, the Silicon Valley narrative was that badges and certificates would replace degrees. We're like in a post-degree world. Um, Ryan Craig talks about this all the time and it's, and it's bullshit. Uh, the fact is that uh, the gap between college educated and non, the gap between graduate school educated and college continues to grow every year. There are good reasons why degrees exist, why universities exist, and those reasons aren't going away. There's no evidence uh, that they are. On the other hand, what is true is in this economy, the stuff you've learned by the time you're 21 or 25 is not going to get you through to retirement. So the question is not degree and non-degree as different spaces or as a blended thing. It's you buy a house and then you know that for a long time you're going to be continuing to fix things and add things and mess with it. There are two moments. There's the buying the house and then there's the fixing the house. Uh, there's the getting the degree and then where you take it throughout your career. So. Should universities be playing in both? I think so. The people they have sold it to, um, as they've kind of boxed themselves out of this space, have been doing this for a decade without any evidence that they're having any impact on people's lives. Right? There are obvious ways to measure life learning, lifelong learning. It is, on this course, what are the goals of the course? What are we trying to do? And we put those up front. And then, not just do you complete the course, or when you finish the course do you say it was good, but did it achieve those goals? Right up front, a year later, two years later, did this course achieve what it said it was trying to do, and take that data and bring it right back in front of everybody who's looking at the course, Right? It's an obvious loop. It's what any one of us would do. That data must exist. The fact that nobody has produced that data publicly suggests that it's pretty grim. So, if you think about what universities have, as again, when you talk to students and say, where do you want a certificate from? They want it from a great university. So the universities have, as I say, the brand, the reputation, they have the content, and they actually have the reach. It turns out that the schools that Noodle already works with have almost four times as many unique visitors every month as Coursera, 10 times as many as edX. That's not the tens of thousands of students who are on their campuses. It's the tens of millions of students who are visiting their sites. 
These are enormous organizations that have global brands and global communities. The alumni of these schools are the people who need lifelong learning. So the question in a sense is not, should we create another competitor in the space? It's how do we empower universities to compete in the space? What we're doing in Noodle um, starts out with a really good economics. And if you think about the lifelong learning space, there are two parts of it. There's what, what is the take rate of the organization for courses and certificate programs? When it generates revenue from lifelong learning, what part do they take, what part do they give to the school or the content provider of any sort? And the second is, if this does generate uh, prospects for degree programs, what do they charge, right? What do they take? At Coursera, uh, they take 50 to 65% of tuition on lifelong learning. And if they generate students for degree programs, they take 40%. So 40% of what you pay in tuition is going to the marketer. We're trying everybody here is trying to lower the cost of great higher education. That's the promise of ed tech. We can make it better and we can make it cheaper. And all of the savings of technology in education, we're just giving them to the marketers. And that's not good policy. It's not sustainable business. Uh, edX takes the first $50,000 of revenue on a course and then they take 50%. And again, if they generate students for the degree programs, they take about 40%. We are taking 15% on the non-degree. Plus, we're taking 20% as a marketing fee if we market the student. If someone else markets them, like we have partners who are aimed at corporations and corporate sales, they get the 20%. But if the school markets it, then they get the 20%, and I'll speak to that in a moment. So net-net, we can keep the cost of the platform, the support, the credit card fees, all of the stuff that you have to do to get this thing working, as low as 15% and never higher than 35%. And on the degree side, if someone comes in, then 20% goes to uh, the marketer. So, the learning itself, what we've tried very hard to do is create something that is well supported and social. In the discovery phase, you're finding the right course. You have access to counselors as well as AI. In the learning phase, you have access to TAs. In terms of social, we all know that education is social. None of the current platforms are in any way social. And you can pretend it's social, like there are 10,000 people in the course and they're all talking, but they're not. It's like a Fox News you know, discussion board. There's nothing, there's no real learning going on that's social. The idea of your team of people who are like you, people who want the same goals, working together and giving them the tools to work together more effectively, both electronically and on ground. I think we will have, and I have no idea if I, I, I can't prove this now, but I'll be able to prove it a year from now, uh, substantially higher completion rates, substantially higher impact. At the same time, for corporations, um, not only is it important to have learning that it, people actually complete, but um, the idea of teams working collaboratively from a corporation becomes even more important, right? So if you think about like search for college, it's a social, the search itself is social. You probably involved your parents, Uncle Bob who knows something about college, maybe had an opinion, you, have, you had some friends, a counselor, like, there was a team thinking you through that search. Education search should be social. 
from a corporate side, it's your marketing department that wants to learn Figma, that wants to uh, uh, figure out prototyping in general. It's, it's groups of people um, who, are, who are collaborating around learning. We're a decade late after these guys. And you look at uh, any number of markets, but this one is, is, uh, is streaming, and it doesn't matter. Uh, Netflix had a long head start. Uh, Disney Plus is already at 100 million subscribers. If you've got good content, you'll do fine. There's plenty of room for uh, more players, and there's plenty of room for higher ed to be in this space. In the degree space, so five years ago, I announced that Noodle would be helping universities build degree programs with a focus on elite schools, and let's say they're the top two or 300 schools. Uh, in 2019, of the launches of degree programs, we were 40% of them. Everybody else, Coursera, edX, 2U, Wiley Pearson, were the others. Last year, we were over 50%, and this year, we're over 60% uh, so far. It's not too late, and we are pretty confident we can do to the non-degree space, uh, to the lifelong learning space, what we've done to the degree space. Um, but the key is doing it together. The key is, I, I don't know if you know this video of the, of the first follower. Fabulous video, worth looking at. Um, this is a barn raising. The number of places that great technology companies like D2L or AstroMU, great universities working together, great companies that market either at the uh, uh, student level or at the corporate level, anybody can be part of this initiative and should be because I think together uh, we can accomplish some really good things. Um, and for instance, on that, if you think about the alumni organizations at each one of these universities, again, collectively, you know, millions and millions of, of, of people. So imagine a Georgetown alum brought in by Georgetown takes a program from Case Western and actually, Case Western, in the end, is paying 20% of tuition back to Georgetown because they brought in that student. Georgetown might give that money to the students or pocket it. I think they'll give the money to the students. But meanwhile, a Case Western alum takes a Georgetown program, and now Georgetown's paying the 20% the other way. In the end, the community of higher ed can take its marketing cost to zero, right? All that money kind of changes hands and zeroes out. Or it leaves marketing at 20%, but all of it goes to the students in the form of, 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 of reduced tuition. Either way, that's what this community should be doing. Like, how do we help lower the cost of great higher ed? So, those are my comments on what we're doing and of the space, but I'd love just to talk about uh, the lifelong learning space and, and, uh, and just questions and comments. Come on, Chad. <laughs> The, I, I want to make sure I answer the right question. Um, in terms of um, in terms of the certificate space, if you think of certificates A as a degree replacement, people getting certs um, in lieu of getting a degree, or B people with degrees getting additional learning, 
the market's really more in the second space than the first. I am not convinced that the first is even a good idea. That's a policy debate, but from a business side, it hasn't caught fire. And the, the reason for that is that degrees mean something, right? Somebody, you know, we need an MBA or we need an accountant, you know, with a, a CPA. And, and we know what skills will come with that degree. And in fact, over time, you start knowing like, someone who graduated from this school is gonna fit well in the organization socially and in a whole bunch of ways. And so you start kind of pulling from there. It's why online education still tends to be very local. Like, uh, you know, well over half of the students in online programs live within 50 miles of the school because employers know that product and there's a network that's been created. Certs don't work like that. You got a cert from this school and it turns out to have been a, a weekend program and at that school it's a, it's a 18 month thing and you have no idea what, what skills and what uh, 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 personalities, what, what characteristics go with any of this degree. How do you put it into your job description? How do you say that it's a term of hiring? So um, I don't see this whole initiative as having tremendous social impact in terms of raising the number of disadvantaged folks who are doing something in lieu of a degree. Hopefully we can make the university admissions process better in general, but that's not the focus of this. How are you defining, how are you defining lifeline learning and is that people paying out of their own pocket? Is it, you know, what happens when it's sponsored? Um, just those numbers you were showing, how is that defined? So if you look at uh, the, the current providers, um, about half their revenue is B2C, about half is B2B. During COVID, B2C did really, really well. But I would argue the long-term secular trend is more and more this is paid for by the corporation. And, and that, uh, if you look at what kind of courses, what kind of certs people get, they tend to be business, tech, health, uh, and all of the kind of fun stuff is, is uh, yeah, 20%. I'm sorry, I think you're supposed to use the mic. Are you finding there's an ideal length and also price point for these certs? Um, we're gonna be somewhat agnostic on this. Uh, there will be courses that are credit-bearing courses that someone might take in the summer as part of, you know, maybe they flag the course in college and they want to uh, catch up. Um, but the sweet spot is uh, a non-credit course might be about a third the length of a credited course and might have a price tag of 30, 40 bucks. Um, a certificate, which is generally a combination of those courses, summing up to the equivalent of one college course, uh, will probably just match Coursera's pricing at, at 40 to 50 bucks a month, and as long as it takes you. Wait, hold on one second. Thank you so much. So if everyone can access anyone's co any university's courses and uh, scale is not an issue, do you think everyone will go to the Stanford's and the Harvard's of the world? Or So I think, I think what you had in mind is very unique and very interesting, which is George Mason, for example, play, uh, pays Ohio State for exchanging students, but would it eventually end up meaning that all the money is going towards a few institutions? Uh, what I would like to see happen is on a sports team, mm -hmm. all of the trainers and coaches and marketers and everybody else, they know who's important, which is the athlete, right? On, in a movie, like it's the actor, it's the director. The faculty and the schools themselves 
are the stars of the show. The question for EdTech is how do we support them effectively, help them become efficient, which they generally aren't, and help their reach, organize them. We think of ourselves almost as a network backbone that somebody has to be focused on just the mechanics of running a network if you want to lower the cost of higher ed in general, both degree and non-degree, there are really only three ways to do it. Three good ways. There's one bad way, which is getting rid of student-faculty engagement. Yeah. Right? That's the secret sauce. All of the studies show it. And the first thought of everybody, oh, you want to lower the cost of higher ed, just get rid of the faculty, because they're pesky. Right? Forgetting that one, a, by the way, teaching is about 20% of the cost of higher ed. So going after that savings is also kind of pointless, right? It's how do you lower the 80%? The cost of academic support and counseling has tripled in the past 20 years. It used to be a third of teaching, now it's the same. Can we lower that? It's just streamlining. B, Scale. If I can take my facilities, if I can take my administrators and help twice as many students, that's a big deal. And there's a really interesting conversation to be have about just how much consolidation will, be, will there be in the space. And, and there are some answers to that. And C is collaboration at scale. You don't have to float on your own bottom. You've got 4,500 schools right now crafting their own tech platform. Every single one of them sucks. Right? So you can live in any house you want, but they're all hovels. Like working together, building out a tech platform that makes sense, you can save everybody money. You can also deliver much better support for teaching and learning. So it's around those things. Sorry, rambling answer. Um, some would suggest that on the B2B side, the corporate side uh, of workforce learning is sort of broken in the, in the decision-making process as to how they look to partner, uh, particularly when it comes to, you know, certificates and even education programs from a tuition reimbursement end. How do you suggest changing that dynamic so that across the board it's not just human, chief human resource officers who are saying it's a benefit, but more importantly it's actually part of the strategy of that organization going forward? It's a really hard question. It's a great question. Um, this, the degree side, Guild and others, usually is, is coming out of the, the benefit side. The thought is, if we help you pursue your life goals, get an associate's, get a bachelor's, get a master's, that will increase retention, and employee satisfaction, and if something good comes out of it in terms of you're doing a better job here, that's, that's a win, but it's not focused that way. The lifelong learning space, the workforce learning space, is I'm gonna give you this library, and there are times very prescriptively, like I, I wanted my whole product team to learn Figma. Like, I thought it was really important that we get good at speaking in images and not just in words. So, I think the opportunity on this side, it's not a benefit, it's a chief learning officer, and it is uh, very focused on actually improving performance. One quick thing about, uh, consolidation in the space and scale that I just want to just throw at you. Think about two curves. The first curve is the cost of actually teaching a student. So you build out a program, you do it right. Let's say it's a million dollars for some master's program. It's more for an undergraduate program because it's many more courses. And you only have one student a year that's a very expensive student, right? 
you have two students a year, you've halved the price. Three students, you've taken it down further. Think of it as a hyperbola with an asymptote, which is every 20 additional students you need somebody to teach them, right? And so there's an ongoing cost that's not particularly high. The second curve, and people look at that curve and they say, oh, scale is great. And, and you will have, you know, serious national schools, there'll only be five universities because, because their cost structures are so good. The second curve is trickier. It's cost of acquisition. If you're a reasonably uh, uh, if your school has a reasonable reputation, either locally or nationally, if you launch a program and it's good, someone will take it. The first student's free. And then you've got kind of an inverted S-curve that it very quickly goes up, it flattens out, and then it goes up again to eventually infinite because You've already taught everybody who uh, in this particular discipline could possibly want a degree who's qualified to go to your school, right? So stack the two curves and you end up with something that dips down and then goes right back up. And that's the total cost of acquiring and teaching a student. The shape of that curve is different based on what discipline, the brand of the school, the tuition, um, the competition. It changes all the time. Your goal as a marketer is to move that curve to the right, but of course, you know, you're ASU and all of a sudden if some state got serious about online learning and had a really, really powerful effort there, your cost of acquisition in that state's going up. How do you redeploy? How do you think about it? Um, so, so even as you're trying to push it this way, other people are trying to push it back. If you're at the implication of that curve, if you really do the math rigorously on a program basis, are that really small programs are gonna die. Not necessarily the school, but a lot of schools are going to have to focus on fewer programs uh, taught. Because, because a curve never gets to a place where it's competitive with other, with other schools of equal quality. The other implication, though, is that large programs are going to be fighting a rearguard action over the next decade. As more schools pop up with regional and local reputations, their marketing cost is going to go up, their curve is going to go to the left, and they're going to find it very, very hard even to stay in place, much less to grow. You will end up with, on any given dis in any given discipline with serious consolidation, with significant consolidation of overall, especially small undergraduate, but not nearly as small a market as people think, as those two things balance out. Sorry, I was thinking of it as uh, that universities develop more of a SaaS model so that basically you become an alum and you sign up for a subscription based that provides certain levels of, of value, let's say three tiers of pricing, and that, that each one gets you different things, some in-person courses, some online courses, um, which is great. It's like how we, we automatically pay $59 a month for LinkedIn learning or, or LinkedIn. So why wouldn't we just become, you know, as alums to our organization or to our schools, why would we not just pay this kind of subscription based to continue in our network, which we're already part of that network, but establishing a revenue stream and, and in exchange for services. Yes, but universities have one more arrow in their quiver than Netflix does, which is alumni giving. And, and the, the, the experience so far that I've seen 
is all of us have been marketed to too many times, have been, the univer your university, your alma mater comes at you asking for money too many times. And to the point where you don't open the envelope. And if you make it a subscription that your alums do, then it feels like they're just picking your pocket again. If you see it as a benefit, we're giving you this. Our courses are free for our alums. Other people's courses are less than you would pay on Coursera, on Noodle, on any place else. This is us wanting to be part of your life journey as a benefit of being an alum, not as an, an ongoing obligation. Can you raise alumni engagement? And if you can, it moves a different meter, which is what percent of your alumni donate? So that turns out to be a really important measure for a couple reasons. One, there's a 0.7 correlation between the percentage of alumni who donate and total endowment per student. In the end, you increase the base of the pyramid, you're gonna get a bigger pyramid. Number two, US News rankings tie to alumni. It's about 3% of the ratings, not huge, but it, it's significant. And, and it's movable in a way that a lot of the other metrics aren't. And number three, in terms of alumni hiring each other, looking out for each other, anything you do to push alumni engagement really adds value to the university in, in, in tough to measure but really important ways. So Netflix can't ask for a donation, but, they, but schools can. Wow. Um, that was either really boring or, or I've explained the whole thing. <laughs> um, any other questions? Yep. Yeah, there's so many uh, online courses, you know, platforms offer very similar courses. Do you recommend any, uh, or are there any like a uh, more like high level organization to qualify these courses? Meaning that, okay, these are better quality than others. As a, cause students don't have that judgment, right? Yeah, right. how would you recommend to have that kind of a process? You know, or even like a hotels, they give the ratings, you know. Are yep. these courses get ratings by public or by? So, uh, there are a few things packed into that. The first one is, um, are what people looking for marketplaces? There are an infinite number of courses to teach anything. And I'll just take this one versus that one based on how many stars it got. Or are you expecting a level of curation? that we're really trying to, in each area, for each audience, find the right course. So that once I know what you want, that's the one. We are approaching it more as the second than the first. I don't need to have 10 things that teach exactly the same thing to the same people. Um, the second, though, is what does good look like? And that's the harder one that I sort of spoke to before that to me, good looks like I am making a promise. This is what I say you'll take out of this. And then I'm circling back to the people who took that course, whether or not they finished it, to see if the promise was kept. And putting that in front of you. And every course actually should be making different promises. This is, this is why you're here I can help you. And it's a good way to say, is this course redundant with another course? Because if they're making exactly the same promises, then it's a question. Oh, wait, give me one sec. Uh, I just wonder what advice you'd have for small schools. It seems like you certainly helped a lot of institutions 
develop scale and growth strategies. But if you're a small school, what, what, at a high level, what, what advice would you have for, for, for those schools as competitors? A couple things. First, collaboration at scale is even more important for smaller institutions. You know, where, where, the, where the tech team might be like, you know, two guys. Um, talking to Lake Hall, talking to other organizations of smaller schools, um, the way a school differentiates can't be on something like its LMS, <laughs> right? That, that can't be that any, you know, that on a list that, that, that parents are looking at that. Um, B, um, collaboration 20, 30 years ago tended to be geographically based. And I would argue that finding schools of like mind elsewhere, weaving into a network that can play nationally, you know, that, that schools keep their independence, they keep their brand, uh, but now they can access some of the tools that only larger schools can. And, and we are talking to various groups of schools because I think there's a there there. Um, and C, small schools have alumni too, and it's probably even more important that they engage them. Good morning. Good morning. I have a little marketing question. In a few months ago, there was this barrage of come to our school and we will take you from the minute you sign up all the, and we'll be with you all the way through your career. Now that's not true, I'm sorry. There were two, two schools with, uh, at the same time saying that they would do this. And the one I've taught at, and uh, I've not found that to be what they've marketed. And they've stopped. Both schools have stopped. It's, it's puffery. Absolutely. But people buy into it. Ish. It's amazing to me. Amazing. It, I, I, I got to say, the, the, the thought that a school could be with you is both is both terrific, but also not necessarily important. Um, one of the things about education in general is you kind of slough your skin every so often. If your preschool had a terrific business school, you still might not go there, even though they were a terrific preschool. Like, you move from preschool and then you go to K-12 and you're at some point kind of done with that and you go to college. and the, it's not, as your journey moves, like as, as you move through life, you may or may not be looking for support from the school you went to, even if they're great. The opportunity of, again, that platform that you're giving your alums is not just your stuff, but a curated version where there, there are, are great other schools too, and together we can have enough content enough skills to, to, to actually help you. It's higher ed, again, engaging collaboratively to solve the problem. I'm not sure any one school could keep that promise or that you'd want them to by itself. Well, we have, we have uh, out of time, and, and I really appreciate the questions and uh, would love to engage uh, further. Thank you. <laughs>